This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day everybody and thanks so much for joining me. This is a very special installment of the show as it is a tribute to the late, great, former Cradle of Filth guitarist, Stuart Anstis. Stuart passed away on Sunday, August 21st. He leaves a tremendous legacy as the guitarist that changed the game for extreme metal. Joining me for the chat is Daniel Mitchell, AKA Autumn's Eyes. Dan is a musician based in Connecticut, and in this tribute, we honor Stuart and discuss the reasons his songwriting and playing are enduringly influential. And because it's a chat, we cover all sorts of other subjects, but it always comes back to the big fella. May he rest in peace, love to his family and his friends as well. So here it is. Dan Mitchell and my tribute to the guitar colossus, Stuart Anstis. We've connected because we're both fans of that era of the groups of Cradle of Filth. And mm-hmm. we got the news yesterday, or certainly yesterday Australian time, in the morning I woke up and there was a bunch of messages there with people saying, say it ain't so, that sort of thing. And I had to double check, of course, so checked on the usual blog sites, Metal Injection or what have you. And you got to take those sites with a grain of salt because where are they getting their information from? But then I started getting some, I got a one message in particular from someone who was very close to Stuart letting me know what had happened. Mm. So that had happened in, in, in many ways. It's one of those moments in time where, where he's in Britain, I'm in Australia, as you're in the United States. Okay, we can't form friendships in the traditional sense, but in this virtual world, we do feel like we know each other. And we all got to know Stuart through his music, but I guess in some ways I also got to know him on a personal level as well. And I can tell you, he's a tremendous fella. He was a family man. So that was where my thoughts first went, was Mm -hmm. to his family and to his wife. And I said it it before in a post and, you know, we had an exchange about it. But uh, I'm so sorry for them to to lose a husband and a father uh, so early, 48 years of age. Absolutely. Tragic. Yeah, it's tough. The only other time I can remember a feeling, you know, musicians have passed here and there and it's tragic. Um, last time, I think it was Peter Steele was the one that kind of hit me right here. And it was like a major impact for me personally. And then this just took me off guard as well and kind of reminded me of that same feeling where it was like, really? Are you sure? Like, like you said, I had to double check the sources make sure it was true and um yeah man it's just it's just sad but that's the great thing about music is that you know that's the one thing we all have in common we're all gonna die right we're all born we're all gonna die at some point but being a musician any type of creative personality your creativity is gonna live long beyond you and that's the one thing we're gonna talk about here about Stuart is his legacy his music his impact Mm. Yeah, it's it's a re- it's a really good take on things you take there because I often think that when a musician, so Trevor Strenard, I think it's how you pronounce his surname, from Black Dahlia Murder left us not too long mm. ago. Andy Gill from Gang of Four did it too. These are all people that I've spoken to. I don't know them, but I've spoken to yeah. to them on the show. But I often think in each of these occasions, and it's really pertinent here, if you had an opportunity to re- to review your life's accomplishments in advance, okay, would you take the accomplishments? that you've achieved in Stuart's case. Mm. Of course, of course you would. Look at how many lives he's touched in, in a really positive oh, sense. And it's such a wonderful thing to be able to create music, music that in my case, at the end of my teenage years, I, I found Cradle of Filth after listening to bands like Deerside and Morbid Angel, and they just changed the game for me. They expanded Absolutely. the musical horizons. And I'm, I know I'm not the only one. And you know, the reason I know that is because you and I have connected and so many other people have connected across the globe through Stuart's music. Sure. Look at all the responses you've gotten from that. I mean that speaks to how great he was for somebody who, I mean, he didn't have that big of a catalog in comparison to a lot of other players out there. He was in cradle of filth, you know, for a tiny amount compared to their, you know, long running status now, but what he did with them, it just, it goes to show you how big of an impact he had. And today I was re listening to, um, the dusk and her embrace, what was it? The uh, the original recordings, like yeah, the original, the original sin sin. recordings yeah. that did yeah. not feature Stuart. And it's almost night and day for me because while the bones are there, the structure is there, you can hear the the riffs and everything. 
when he took that, it's a great example of how he, you know, put his chef's kiss on that because yeah, the riffs were the same, but the playing, which I've heard you mention, he kind of played a little bit behind the beat and he would go up. My favorite thing hands down about him was he would go up on the fretboard where a lot of us, you know, metal guitar players, we want to stay down here the whole time mm. and chug. Stuart was the one who went up here and he was making it melodic. And if you listen to songs like Malice Through the Looking Glass, um, he has a lot of complementary harmonies on that where standard harmonies you'll hear like In Flames or even Iron Maiden, you'll hear like the same part, but a harmony played the same way um, in the left speaker and right speaker. Stuart would actually take a completely different part, almost like an orchestration where he'd be playing a low rhythm on the left channel, right channel would be like a high melody and it would just complement each other so well. And that original Sin, Dusk and Her Embrace mix is a perfect example of how he elevated that band to the next level. And then of course, as you know, Cruelty was just an absolute metal masterpiece. I'm with you. It's one of the best heavy recordings ever done. Yeah, the game changer, not just for Cradle of Filth, but for extreme metal in general. Absolutely. I, yeah. I often make this point with people that I talk to, not necessarily so much on the show, although I have done it a few times, but I think you, you're of my vintage, right? You really had to be there back in the day in the late 90s to understand how and how much in the doldrums metal was from a mainstream mm. perspective. You, you couldn't read about it except for in the metal magazines. HMV and Sanity and Sam Goodies, I think you've got in the States or had in the States there, you know, those uh -huh. those record stores, those CD shops, they were in a little corner somewhere, or if they stocked them at all, Cradle were one of the few bands where you could, and that was the important point. Cradle got to the point through Stuart's contribution, I believe, where it took the band, and I made the point yesterday in my, my post from Outsiders to somewhere near now it's not somewhere near the mainstream but it's somewhere that somebody someone's mum could say buy them a cradle of fill cd from the record stores and that was crucial yeah and that's mm -hmm. Stuart's contribution and that started when kit wolven and Stuart partnered on dusk and her embrace so to your point there the yeah. original sin version yeah sure it's paula lender and ben ryan wrote a classic album no doubt about that mad props mm -hmm. to them it took Stuart and Kit Wolven to take it to the next level, to remint it, if you like, that chef's kiss that you're, you're talking about there, to 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 give it that polish that made people like me who were right into Morbid Angel, Obituary, Deicide, all of you, Immortal, Satyricon, Mayhem, great bands. Oh, yeah. Uh, we heard, I heard Cradle and I was like, oh, what is this? Do you what remember the first time you heard them, like where you were, how it was, CD, tape? Yeah, Triple J, Three Hours of Power, uh, oh, radio, radio show in Australia in 1995, I think it was, mm -hmm. and it was a song from Vampire. Was it Vampire or Principal was played? And No, it must have been Vampire, sorry. It had to be Vampire because of Stuart's playing. I remember that. And, mm -hmm. and I just stopped what I was doing. It might have been Queen of Winter Throned. Mm -hmm. And I stopped what I was doing, and I couldn't, truth be told, mate, I couldn't. Back in the day, there were no internet internet to go to to check, okay, yeah. what song was played where? I was like, what is that yeah. bloody band? And then it took until Danny was interviewed about six months or so later on, on that program, and they did a big block. Costa Zulio was the DJ, I remember, great DJ. And he did a big block of Cradle songs and had this interview with Danny and just sped between the cuts, and I was sold straight away. It was instant. But the mm. reason I was sold was the guitar playing. Being a young guitarist, being a bass player, I heard that guitar playing and I thought I was right into Iron Maiden as well, and I thought, there it is. Finally, someone's joined the dots between. Isn't that clever, I thought? Someone's joined the dots between that classic new wave of British heavy metal, Adrian Smith-style guitar work, mm. and black metal. It's here. It's here now. And for a young fella, fairly right into music, I just used to spend so much time in my room playing and, and listening to music. It was the sound that I'd envisioned and somebody had created it. It was right there. It was like a switch went off in your head, right? 100%. That's exactly yeah. what happened. Now, yeah. Did you start playing and like mimicking Stuart or like learning how to play those riffs? I'd, I'd be that. flattering myself if I said that I learned how to <laughs> mimic his riffs because I just didn't. I, I'm a bass player by trade, I must confess. I learned that very yeah. early on. I like getting right yeah. into the groove, but I did. I had a, a Rhodes V copy and I'd sit there and I could play Venom 
Yeah, I could play Mantis' and cuts, but I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't really. I didn't have the effects and stuff. I didn't have the wherewithal to sit there and really mm. study Stuart's playing. But I knew I was listening. Frankly, I knew I was listening to Genius, mm. and and that's I just appreciated it. To be honest with you, that's that's what it yeah. came down to. Just pure appreciation. Yeah, I remember it was a buddy of mine who lent me. I think it was Cruelty. I'm pretty sure that was my introduction, and right off the bat. I loved the drums because I started as a drummer and Nicholas was just, it just blew my mind. I mean, at the time I had been into dream theater, that was like the bar that was set by Mike Portnoy. And mm. I heard Nicholas and I was like, this has to be like a machine. This is not possible. Nobody can drum that fast. And then Stuart's guitar playing. I was like, wait a minute, something's going on here. It didn't really hit me as, as quick as it hit you. Cause I wasn't really a guitar player at the time. Um, I did not like the vocals. <laughs> I hated the vocals <laughs> at first. It took me some getting used to, as did Dream Theater. Their vocals took a while to get into, but mm. it was the musician musicianship, or uh, what do you call it? Like um, the arrangements yeah. that really got yeah. to me because it was like the keyboards. Was that Les that was playing on that? On Cruelty? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Les Smith. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, it was Maybe like that atmosphere. Of him. It was mm. like tons and tons of reverb on the keys and then the guitars just like melded everything together and even the bass like the bass robin was like my god he was like he he knew when to serve the song he would you know play in the pocket and then he'd have these little moments that would come out that were just brilliant and just the band as a whole grew on me and i just fell in love with it so much to where i couldn't stop listening to it mm. over and over and over it became one of those albums that was just on repeat constantly and then yeah same got into same. yeah got into dusk and then vampire um and i remember when i first saw stuart a picture of him he had that warlock guitar the bc rich and I had been playing Ibanez. I started noodling around on my brother's guitar. He had a few Ibanezes and um, mm. playing those. And then I saw Stuart with the Warlock. And I was like, that's the most evil looking guitar I've ever seen. I have to get one. Went and got like a really cheap one um, at the time. And I've been playing BC Rich ever since. Mm. I, I can see. Nice work behind you there. Oh, yeah. See, they're yeah. all over the place here. Um, so that was another thing another big contribution he had to me as well as the um, orchestrations and arrangements and stuff. I did an album called surrender the fire in 2008 where it was like, that was like my love letter to Stuart basically, because I always wanted to do an album where it was like those types of guitar parts, like the left channel and right channel battling it out and then coming together on certain parts. And, um, yeah, I'm still trying to process the fact that he's gone and that we're never going to hear him reconcile with the band. I know you've brought that up a lot in these interviews that you've done, which great job on all those. I mean, what Thanks more can we ask for yeah. as Cradle fans? But the fact that like we'll never get that, you know what I'm saying? Like we want that classic lineup together at some point, even if it's just like a one off thing would be amazing to hear. But obviously it's not going to happen now. Yeah, look, that that Clive Barker concept album that was partially written, I, I can't imagine what that would have sounded like. We have a hint, though, uh, due to yeah. the song Of Dark, Blood and Fucking, which appeared on the From mm -hmm. the Cradle to Enslave EP. Stuart, as, as you know, you listen to the chats, he wanted that left, he wanted didn't want to include that, he didn't even want that EP out there. That, mm -hmm. that, uh, that was a bloody, in his words, somebody opened their fucking mouths and the, <laughs> and the record company said, yes, we'll have an yes. EP. So I can't imagine who that would have been that said that, but anyway. Sure. Uh, the the thing about that song there is that, so if you take, uh, plenty of people disagree with me on this, and I understand that, where the band were at on Vampire, which is reminted cuts, but a few new ones, Queen of Winter Throne too, but then you you, you heard the leap, really, because it co goes from Queen of Winter Throne and those songs, the songs mm -hmm. on Vampire, to Cruelty, because Dusk and Embrace is actually written before Vampire was released. Yeah. Okay, yep. so you really have to go from vampire to cruelty. That's a quantum leap when you think about it. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the, like I know the production is is another matter altogether, and we'll talk about that in due course, of course. But the 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 way in which Stuart was structuring his songwriting, he never stayed in the one spot for too long. 
Okay, so Queen of Winter Throned to the cuts on cruelty, which are really all time. But then you start to go into more almost a hardcore punk aesthetic with of Dark Blood yes, and fucking. Yeah. And it was yep. like, wow. So this is a bloke who married new ways of British heavy metal to black metal. Now he's introducing elements of hardcore. And then keep in mind too, around about 2001 or two, I have only heard a little bit of it and I know that it's out there, but he released some electronic demos. Okay. I heard about those, yeah. Yeah, I can't recall the name. Somebody out there is probably yelling at us and saying, yeah, this, you guys aren't <laughs> fans enough if you don't know the names of this stuff that he released. But look, the yeah. point is the musical universe was his playground, okay? He wasn't pigeonholing himself into this or that like so many do, okay? We as fans, we're just along for the ride. But I want to go back to a point that you raised earlier, which is about his relationship with Nick Barker or Nick Barker's contribution to the band as well. Mm. The most important and impactful uh, duo in terms of guitar and drum duo, I think, in black metal and, and broadly oh, speaking, extreme metal. Okay. I, I've listened, so I, I've long marveled at the way in which the two were able to lock in with each other, and they were great friends too. Nick said that, Stuart said that about Nick, and Nick said that about Stuart. So they, they got along, they were good mates, but that often doesn't translate to the rehearsal room because you can't often be honest with each other. About yeah how things are actually working, particularly because these are songs that, that that Stuart wrote and then he'd bring them into the rehearsal studio and then sort of woodshot them with Les and Nick. Mm-hmm. By, by the way, that, and that's my explanation, but he's gone into much deeper detail, as you know, in the chat that I had with yeah. him. True. But Nick, the point is Nick knew how to craft the cadence of the bass drum to complement the way that Stuart played, unlike anybody else. So there, there just wasn't ever a, a beat out of place. And, and I'm trying to think of some of the songs that – that really that, that highlight that work. And it's impossible to isolate any one tune from Dusk and Embrace or Cruelty and say this is one above all the other because it's so consistent and that's the marvel. That's a great point because a lot of bands that I was listening to at the time, the drummer was always, you know, like four on the floor and like, you know, doing the double kick thing. The guitarist would play syncopated with them mm. and that was cool. But it's interesting you bring that up because Nick almost treated the kick drums as like an instrument you'd play with your hands almost like, I don't know how to ex- explain it, but like you're saying yeah, he complimented okay. Stuart's playing and like, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, a song that would be a good example of that. But I mean, really any of them, um, cause Nick was very un- unconventional He was fast, but he was fast in a way that he wasn't showing off saying, look how fast I am. He was doing it in a way to complement the music. If you really listen to his fills and stuff where he is just zooming down the toms, he's going into his splash symbols as he's going down the toms. And it's just mental. You're trying to process this. But at the same time, it works. It's not taking you out of the song. It's Mm. complementing the song. And that's a great sign of a good musician. Mm. Indeed, and another sign of a of a great musician. And uh, look, again, I've copped a bit of flack for saying this, but I believe that he actually improved one of the one of the greatest heavy metal songs ever written, "Hallowed Be Thy Name." Hallowed Be Thy Name, yeah. Because <laughs> I, I don't know how he did it, but they sped it up, of course, mm-hmm. and sped it up. But then he added this this take on it that made it sound even more bombastic than the original. And I, and I think the original's just, and I think the band have hinted at that. Iron Maiden, that is. They played a lot yeah. faster live than what it is on the album. It should have been a lot faster, ultimately, because mm-hmm. that's the band. You, you naturally gravitate toward a, a groove, and Stuart picked up on that, and he introduced, I think, the most perfect tempo for that there, and that, that would have been a collaboration between he and Nick, uh, no doubt. Yeah. But um, And the guitar leads, the guitar leads that he introduced there and the solo, the way in which he expanded on the solo there, just mm-hmm. awesome stuff. There's a funny story about that song. When I first heard that, my friends and I were in a band and just, you know, local crappy band, whatever. We Our shtick was we would paint our face with highlighters. We would crack open a highlighter, paint our faces oh with the God. yellow goop inside. Yeah. Because if you yeah. turn a black light on, your face would glow. So it was like glowing corpse paint. And that was our, <laughs> our deal. It was kind of our gimmick. And we played a show on Halloween one night locally here in Connecticut and it was like a packed house. Everybody was dressed up. The atmosphere was great. And we played Hallowed Be Thy Name in the style of Cradle. 
the only problem is our singer at the time um didn't take time to learn the lyrics even though it's maiden you know how could you not know that song but he didn't know it so we were like you want to do the song you want to do the song we're like we can't he doesn't know the the words we're like i got an idea so i asked my buddy greg in the audience i'm like you know how to sing this song right he's like yeah i'm like have you ever sang before he's like in my car i'm like get up here so greg got up on stage with us and just absolutely nailed it just like mm. He had been singing for 10 years as a metal singer, like the scream and everything. And I took over the lead duties and I played the solos as best as I could, which was nothing compared to how Stuart was playing them. But after that show, that was like a turning point for me because I'd gotten so many calls saying, um, that was such a great performance. You know, do you want to come play with our band? I had a lot of bands asking me to play with them and stuff. And how did you come up with a, a cover like that? And I was like, it's not me. It's Cradle of Filth. And this guy, Stuart, uh, you know, played this stuff. And hmm. that was like spreading his gospel, basically. And I introduced a lot of people to his playing because of that. And still to this day, I always listen to that song on Halloween because of that. It's just a great memory. Yeah, it's so crisp, isn't it? I listened to that song with headphones on because I had a version of, gosh, it come out on a version of Dusk or Cruelty. Cruelty. It came across, it had like a cross it was, I can't remember. Yeah. Was it Cruelty, wasn't it? I think. Yep. And they did a so, double CD too that had like the alternate versions of um, that last song, track 10. And there was like another version of something else and then the hallowed be thy name oh, was the on last mortem orgasm version i think yeah it was, yeah, wasn't it? yeah, it. yeah 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 i i just remember hearing it and also i've I've spoken to uh one of the members of anathema about their cover of sleepless and, oh sure uh, it was interesting he wasn't he wasn't a huge fan really and yeah i i think it was more that Stu stewart when he's playing the key thing about Stuart with his playing is he really comes at it from, in my opinion, anyway, short, you know, I'm saying it, so of course it's my bloody opinion, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, he's coming at it from the musician's angle. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's coming at it from what he thinks works from a musician's perspective. And, and that's my takeaway from all of the conversations, well, the four hour conversation that I had with him, but everything that he did, he, 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 he studied it and he thought, well, how can I how can I use the fretboard to its fullest extent? How can I make this? How can I use the fretboard to my advantage? Can mm -hmm. I get it out eventually? There we go. And and I think he did that. But I think think the member of Anathema was it Dan or Vincent? That oh, was Dan. Yeah, it was Dan. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Dee's a good bloke, by the way, Dan. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. But I think. It was it was just one of those things where you know someone's got a version and they go for this vibe and another band goes for this vibe here. And Athena mm -hmm. always had that very ethereal, almost ethereal Pink Floyd thing going on. And of course, Stuart oh, wasn't yeah. really he wasn't really about that. But uh, there, there was another point I wanted to make about some of Stuart's guitar guitar playing on on Cruelty, and I guess this is a brand new point, so I'll go there now. That if I go through some of the highlights, just specifically about his guitar playing. Because I had to think about it last night, and I thought, well, which are the actual bits? If you're going to highlight them to somebody who hasn't heard Stuart's guitar playing before, and say, "This is where this fellow's a genius," and here I go. So there, the leads that run counterpoint under the verse in thirteen autumns and a widow. I love what he does there. I love Les and Stu's interplay through the crescendo, crescendo of beneath the howling stars. Stuart just mm. locks it down, but occasionally he just does a bit of a flurry there. And oh, that's sure. all he's playing, as we know. That's all he's writing. We know John didn't yeah. write. Mm -hmm. The the leads at the end of Desire in Violent Overture, they're just oh, pure God. Iron Maiden, just straight up Adrian Ooh, Smith nuts. right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Stuart's favourite cut, of course, was the Twisted Nails of Faith, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they, these songs are like children, and maybe he didn't feel as though that was a song. Certainly, I don't. I'm not recall. Uh, I, don't, I haven't seen a video of it being played live, but uh, I don't Did he elaborate that. on on why he didn't care for that much? I think he did, but for the life of me, I can't remember now talking to mm. you um, what it was about that one there. But I know he had a soft spot for that one. They're all well, nominated it as, as his fave. Mm. And um, just talking about cruelty, you know, the the gnarly black and thrash at the end of Last Maud and Wargasm. Oh, where yeah. he, he took that mayhem template and in, introduced the Jeff Hanneman, as I like to call it, yeah. the Jeff Hanneman. And I think that was another understated aspect of his playing was that in Twisted Nails of Faith, I think it is, he has that that great 
Jeff Hanneman style guitar lick that comes in at the introduction just after the first part of the verse. Yeah. So this is a bloke who took so much, as we've already mentioned, but he took so much of the musical universes and 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 compacted it in a way that actually made sense with each other. But I thought I'd just offer offer those moments across Cruelty and the Beast. You know, people have heard me talk about how much of a yeah. an appreciator of I am of that. But do you have any moments yourself where that you could isolate and say, hey, this is where I feel Stuart's playing really Sean? Yeah, the one that stuck with me was is it 13 Autumns and a Widow? That's the one that starts with the the chick who's saying the thing, hear me now, whatever. I'm terrible yes. with song names. You know, no, I'm partner. with you, mate. I'm, people have pulled me up on that too. They said, you know, I said, know the album if you don't know yeah, that. But yeah. it's like, because I listened to it on the <laughs> CD in the car 99% of the time. And then exactly, the streaming yeah. came in and it's it's just on in the background or you're grooving along. It's like the song name is sort of secondary to the fact that you're enjoying yeah. it. But I, I think you're it. right. Yeah. No, totally. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's the one that got me because that riff that he does um, is a verse where he's playing that like dan, 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 and he's like yeah. doing that like skip on the palm mute oh the cruelty that and the was... beast that's a song cruelty and the beast I think that oh, okay yeah, yeah okay yeah. cruelty yeah. and the beast yeah see I told there's proof I'm terrible with song <laughs> <laughs> at least I got the band right I'm not naming like you know <laughs> Michael Bolton songs like they do that how can we be lovers song that's them right no um Sorry, that I was even big... got it wrong. Sorry, it's cruelty bought the orchids. I had to just check it then. <laughs> Man, we're terrible. We're awful. What? Well, it's as I say, mate. It's yeah. We're not talking about Michael Bolton or bloody Kylie Minogue to your point, mate. So you know, people can get sorry. Yeah. To be honest, with you, people can get stuffed if they want to pick us up on that. And sort these of aren't stuff. the easiest song names to remember. You know, oh, let's remind God people. Sakes. It's not like single name songs. They're like paragraph long song names here. We're musical um, appreciators, but sorry, you continue. Continue with your point. Yeah. <laughs> So that riff was a big one. And then another thing was the pick slides down the neck. I still, to this day, cannot emulate Stuart's pick slides down the neck. And yeah, it, it kills me. That's in Violent Overture, that song. That, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's just killer. That's gnarly. Yeah, there's so many. And the, and the other thing, too, was I mentioned Kit, his, his partnership with Kit Wolven. Tragically, mm-hmm. this this is the bloody issue, mate. Is that people? Obviously, we're, we're we're connected for this reason, but they're no longer with us, and and yeah. it's it's tragic because I, I had Kit. I'd actually tried to reach out to Kit a few times before he passed away last year. Oh, really? Kit was Kit was not a heavy metal guy at all. Sure, he did the Thin Lizzy stuff, but I don't think anybody would call Thin Lizzy a heavy metal band. I mean, they've got that element to it, but it's rock and roll. Yeah, it's rock. It's rock and roll, and when you listen to the production. That that Kit imbued Dusk and her embrace. It was custom. It was perfect for Stuart's guitar playing because it mm-hmm. gave all of this space to the music. And this is an era, as you well recall, this is an era when the cardboard box bass drum and angry angry bees in a honey jar <laughs> sound. It was considered the. It was de rigueur, wasn't it? There was yeah. so much shit that was out there. And I'm I'm sorry, but a lot. If extreme metal bands rise to the top and they're well known, it's because they're great like yeah. Cradle. You're not going to mm-hmm. sort of go digging too much. There are a couple of really killer underground bands like Time Ghoul and stuff that elected to remain in the underground who I think are unbelievable yeah. and could yeah. have taken the next step if they had good management like what Cradle did with Faye, Faye Wolven. But sorry, I might, I might want to finish my point around, around Kit. Kit. Kit gave Stuart the opportunity to really shine. And mm. what, I, what, I, what I'm so disappointed I didn't get an opportunity to, to ask Kit about was just – just hit me with it. Tell me, what was it like working with Stuart? Stuart talked about Kit pushing him to his limit. But what does that mm. mean? What does that actually mean? I mean, you and I have both spent time in the studio, so we know how stressful it can be. It can be mm-hmm. bloody awful when you're having a bad day. You can actually, for those people who don't know, these days you've got digital audio workstations. You can work from home and you can make an album which sounds better than what Metallica's Black did. Okay, Mm -hmm. but back in the late 90s and early 2000s, you had to book studio time if you wanted to have anything resembling a professional product. Now, it was expensive. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? It was a couple of grand a day. (laughs) Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. and and oftentimes you came out with a product that you're only half happy with because you didn't Mm -hmm. understand how to use the desk or you didn't understand what – and you had to rely on the the expertise of the engineer. But Mm -hmm. but with with a a producer, somebody like Kit – you know he was a taskmaster if Stuart oh, sure. says that he was pushed to his absolute limit. So I just wanted to understand what that meant. 
Yeah, I wish we could get more detail into that because I'm a huge studio nerd. I'm not really the biggest fan of live stuff. Um, I just love anything studio related. If it's like gear talk, how they got the sound out of this or that. Like I watch um, those documentaries that Metallica did. They have like a treasure trove of stuff in the studio with Bob Rock and how they made all these mm. albums just showing them working and Bob Rock pushing Kirk Hammett to get the solo for Enter Sandman, let's say, and pushing him over the line. I wish we could get that with, like you said, Stuart and all these other bands that are not as high a caliber as Metallica or profile, I should say, um, just to see, you know, what made them get to that spot. How did Stuart get pushed into writing those riffs the way he did? What was the dynamic like in the studio? Um, there is a constant that I hear a thread, if you will, throughout all your interviews that you've done. And it has to do with the lead singer. It's like the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. Everybody has contentious thoughts about the lead singer. Um, and it makes me wonder how much did that impact the recording? Was that a, a sore spot for people or did it influence people to write something even heavier or more intense? You know, I, I wish we could get those details. Yeah. Yeah. The Danny thing comes up a lot and I've mm -hmm. been careful to sort of keep out of its way in so far as let some, let people talk about what they want to talk about in as much detail or even as little yeah. detail without actually sort of reaching in and trying to drag it out. Of course. And, yeah. Look, it's fair to say there was massive conflict there and, 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 this is not new news. Paul Alinda told me a lot, but he asked me not to share it. He, li he lives yeah. near you these days. He's in the, I'm not near you specifically, but he lives in the Midwest of the USA. These the truck days. driver, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, I, part of me really feels for Paul. I've got to be honest with you on that front because, I mean, he carried that band from his, his re entry around Midian, writing that album right up to when he left in 2012 or 13 on that bloody tour he didn't want to go on to. And yeah. uh, Paul deserves massive credit for keeping that band on the rails. With, with sure. this, all of the members have said this. Not my opinion. I'm just saying what the members have said. Danny doesn't write. It's mm -hmm. that simple. It's Danny doesn't write. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to all of the fanboys out there who think that because it's his band and he's just he's been very fortunate that he's managed to draw exemplary musicians around him and most recently Richard Shaw's left and Richard's a fantastic fella too. He's declined to come Absolutely. on the show, I might add. I have had a conversation with him over Messenger. Yeah. He's declined to come on the show and his view, he said everything he wanted to say on that. That Did you, what did you, did, have you watched the most recent thing where he was talking about why he left and why he didn't want to be in the band anymore? Richard Shaw, that is. I think so. It was something... You'll have to refresh my memory. I don't remember. I, he could I not have picked a worse. He could not have picked a worse podcast than the one he went on to. These idiots. Really? He had one guy virtually yelling, "Yeah, like a total Howard Stern style shock jock." Ah, this sort of shit. And you can see Richard's like going, "Okay, uh, oh, yeah. trying to answer the question seriously." Yeah, it's nothing like in the way that I'm not hoisting my flag here. But you know, you've listened to enough of my stuff, and we've connected over the conversations. Yeah. Just let people talk and have a conversation and just be a regular fella. Mm -hmm. Have your cup of coffee or your beer, whatever it might be, and sit down and just let it flow. Okay, don't yeah. don't try to take it in these different weird directions because it's not necessary. Um, yeah, I and, agree. And I think it was a missed opportunity because Richard told me that he'd said all he wanted to say, and I think that was the opportunity to, to say what he wanted to say that he was talking about. And I'm thinking mm. you've got to create an environment where someone feels comfortable actually sharing their story. And that probably um, soured his experience. And oh, I, I think it sour, certainly soured my experience. <laughs> I don't know whether it soured his. <laughs> yeah, it certainly soured my listening experience. Trying to trying to um, understand what his reasons were, but again, it was cryptic. It's a bit like with Sarah. And I've I've had many exchanges with Sarah. Even just yeah. this morning, we were talking to each other. Sarah Jessabel Diva. Mm -hmm. On um, she's communicating. She's commenting on some of the posts that I've got out there, and I'm just messaging back and forth publicly. You know, not even messenger yeah. message, but I have had email conversations with her and stuff as well. Th there's just this. People allude to things. They're cryptic in the band. Stuart was direct. Mm -hmm. Nick was direct. I think Greg was pretty direct. Actually, when I, when I think about it, it's not that. It's not that people haven't spoken their mind. People have been very 
very care- the band members have been very careful to paraphrase what they're saying in the context of the amount of time that has passed since their since their time in the band. Yeah. In just yeah. about all cases, it's over 20 years, longer, 25 years in some cases. But I mean, Ben's almost 30. Oh, sure. Ben Ryan yeah. is almost 30 years, and he was very careful to do that. So look, I get that. It'd be like me into someone interviewing you and I and saying, so you went through school with this bloke and you said you were a wanker. You're going, okay, he said I was a wanker, <laughs> but I was last at school yeah. 30 years ago, so what am I going to say about that? Yes, he's a wanker too, you know. Yeah. So yeah. so I think they've been very careful and they've, they've all been polite. And these these guys are all intelligent fellas too, so they're, they're not going to put their foot in it by saying something that can't be substantiated in some way, shape or form. And I think that's been the issue is that, and again, it hints at why I'm so keen to talk to everybody because so much time is now passing. You want to try and get people when their memories are, it's not that they're going to lose their memories or what have you, but like we spoke about before the chat, meaning we've got lives, kids, families, yeah. mortgage payments, jobs, master's degrees to do this sort of thing. And there's a lot that gets in the way of our memories. And you don't want to sort of put something out there which might not be, it might be how you recall things, but it might not be when, once the interview is posted. And it's out there. Yeah. How you actually feel about it once you listen to yourself saying something publicly, because there's always that fact to, to keep in mind mm-hmm. is that we're having a conversation and then it gets broadcast for, in Stuart's case, tens of, and I can tell you, tens of thousands of people have listened to that one there based on the download. Sure. Numbers. But, and there's, yeah, sorry. Go. Yeah. People are different in the sense that, like, I know, because I'm a very outspoken person, I always, almost to a fault, speak my mind. And sometimes it's gotten me into, you know, hot water. Other times it's gotten me respect because people value an honest opinion. Um, Some people like Stuart, which is why I appreciated that interview so much, like to be candid, forward, straight to the point. Other people, not so much. They like to not dance around it, but just for their own sake, they don't want to stir the pot. You know, they don't want to put any fuel on the fire um which kind of frustrates me because like i said i'm that type of person where i'm just very open and honest and i want to hear all the juice all the dirt up front which i think a lot of people do and the dancing around the elephant in the room thing um it's frustrating and i'll be honest when i saw the news about stewart the first thing i did was i checked cradle's social account i wanted to see Cause you know, it's, it's Dan. I wanted to see if he's going to reply, what he's going to say, if he's going to say anything. I got annoyed at first. Cause I'm like, how could he not post anything? But then I did see, he did post something very nice and very sweet in honor of Stuart. Um, so that was good to see. I wish we could flesh out some more. Um, because as a fan of that era of cradle, I kind of take it personally, which a lot of fans do. I, you know, you you listen to this band for so long and it's hard to detach yourself from that. Um, growing up, listening to this entity, you don't know these people personally. You don't, you know, know anything beyond the little blips you're reading here and there. But that's part of being out in the public eye is that whatever you put out there, you have to be responsible for, whether that's good or bad. And in Danny's case, he hasn't put a lot out there directly that's bad, but everybody else that's been around him has kind of like lifted up all this stuff and all these stories and all these rumors and hints and stuff to where you almost, you know, can't help but build your own opinion of what happened behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating because when I listened to like your interview with Lindsay, um, I think you did that while she was still in the band and now she's out Mm -hmm. and she had made a comment where she said, you know, she was joking about Danny and the filths, but she said that in the end, you've got to make the boss man happy. And that I kind thought of that was really me. revealing, mate. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Very that was, wasn't that revealing? Because it's as a musician, as you know, to have a band work as a cohesive unit, you have to gel and you really have to respect one another. You have to give each other space, freedom, creativity, um just allow each other to breathe and push and pull in your own way to make it work and it's very difficult to have that work over you know years and years and years and it's okay if that's if that's what you want to do like a good example would be ghost tobias he when you come into ghost you know this is you know you're a hired gun it's tobias forge he's the guy running the show he's writing the songs it's his project it's extremely successful 
Um, but it's his gig and he got into some stuff with his earlier bandmates and kind of stumbled into that. But yeah, I, that, I think yeah. he's got it now to where it's like a well-oiled machine and they're doing great. You know, they, they get shit on by metal fans everywhere, but they, I don't think he cares or they care, but that's an example of how it might be able to work in their favor. Whereas cradle, it almost seems like every time there's a new lineup, Danny comes out and he's like, yeah, this is it. This is the lineup. This is the one it's going to work. And then, you know, you look at your watch, you're like, and done. They're out. Okay. Who's next? Bring in the Mm -hmm. next band member. And it's just a rotating revolving door of musicians. And it's sad because I'm with you where that lineup with Stuart and John and Les and Nick and Danny and Rob, that was just perfection right there. And that's where, I'm very selfish. I I hold on to that and I don't want to let go of that. I don't like seeing, it's almost like seeing, you know, your parents get divorced or something. You don't want to see them leave. You don't want to see them fight and, you know, squabble this and that. You want to see them get back together, have a big reunion show, record the, you know, cruelty part two and everybody will be happy and whatever. But, you know, it is what it is. It's a harsh reality to face. Well, as I I mentioned, like, 1998, 1997 and 1998, the year the year was 98 when Cruelty came out. Mm. Judas Priest were, were bumbling along. Even though I liked Jugulator, I thought it was a great album. I bought it when it came mm-hmm. out. Glenn Tipton had a solo album out too, which wasn't too bad. Iron Maiden, though, were well and truly off the rails, which they've kind of oh, more sure. or less acknowledged in, a, in and around that way with Blaze. They, they made... I think Steve just got it wrong. I don't understand why they didn't tune down half a step to accommodate for Blaze's baritone there, but anyway... The yeah. point is that the biggest bands, even Slayer, Slayer, I didn't mind Diablos and Musica, but plenty of, most people hate it. Mm-hmm. But they they weren't playing the music that got them big, the Raining Blood stuff, the Seasons of the Abyss stuff, mm-hmm. the Seasons of the Abyss stuff. It it was a different era. Metal bands had gone. They were out to pasture. The Rolling Stone had written that those classic albums by Metallica, Ride the Lightning and Master of Puppets were transition albums. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> the bridge the gap between Kill 'em All and uh, the Black Album, the flawless Black yeah. Album, I think they called. I mean, just dumb statements at the time, mm-hmm. written by people who didn't have any skin in the game and viewed heavy metal, be people like you and I who are into it, as as just not worthy. Apparently, that's why they'd make these statements because they didn't think that they were ever going to be challenged. Sure, but that era, when you talk about that lineup, there here's my point. When you talk about that lineup, there. It changed the game completely, as I've mentioned up the top. The Cruelty lineup introduced so many, the, the Stuart and the Cruelty lineup and that album, it it was literally, in, in my opinion, it's the turning point. Okay, so metal was going down like this. Yes, I understand that there are other bands, but Carcass had gone away too. There's leading lights I'm talking about. They were either gone or they were, they were out, on, they were on the canvas. Okay, mm-hmm. Cruelty came out. And you could see it. You could go down to uh, the CBD in Sydney or Brisbane or what have you, no doubt in New York too, and you'd see Cradle T-shirts. You'd see mm-hmm. people wearing band merch again, those great Vampirotica. Mm-hmm. I had a couple of them. I wish I still had them. You know, paid a fortune for them, 90 bucks Australian or whatever it was, but they had like gold paint on them and stuff and they had the supreme oh, yeah. vampiric evil thing on the back. <laughs> Their merch sucks now compared to that. Oh, yeah. That merch bag, and it had all of this ornate design. This is why. This is where I did my podcast yeah, um, t-shirt. This is why I do this now because I remember. I remember you walk around and you felt a million bucks because you were mm-hmm. wearing a classy band t-shirt yeah. with your Doc Martin boots. I got kicked boots. out of school for one of them. Oh, the which was, one? The Jesus one or the Jesus? It is a was cunt two one? of them actually. It was the Jesus is a cunt, and then I remember the vice principal of our school. He said, "You can't ever wear a shirt like that again." Okay. I'm like, all right, all right. The next day I came to school with a shirt that said, dead girls don't say no on it. <laughs> I remember <laughs> that one. <laughs> yeah. They're like, what are you doing? Really? Come on. Go home. I'm like, all right. It's yeah, all right. I'll never forget that one. I had the Dark Goddess Rising and the the Supreme Vampire Empiric Evil one. And oh, I liked yeah. the, I had the, I liked the Supreme Vampire Empiric Evil one because it looked like Nicole Kidman was on the front. I don't know if yeah, you remember yeah. that one. It's a black haired Nicole course. Kidman was yeah. on the front. And the other one, it looked like uh, the Catherine Zeta Jones. I remember because oh, it was right, Yeah. Yeah. I remember it's Catherine. It looked like they they got these these actresses in. And that's what I loved <laughs> about them because I was a, I've always been a red blooded male, you know, from the perspective mm-hmm. that love beautiful women and all the rest of it. And sure. never got into the grimy, dirty shit, you know, the weird shit or whatever, you know, the pungent scent, stench stuff, as I call yeah. it, you know. And my cats are biffing each other over there. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
But uh, I, I love the fact that they actually put the detail into that. And that's one question I would love to ask Danny, because it has been, people have messaged me and said, when you talk to Danny, ask him what happened to Vampirotica, to that mm-hmm. merch line, because it was here. And then you could see it after Midian. And, and I'm sorry, you can see it. You can see after Midian, the quality of the merch just became really yeah. mixed up with just basic shit, really. It was like yep. as if it went for quantity over quality, whereas the band Absolutely. up to that point was always about the quality. And I'd, I'd love to know what happened there. And just to put a bow on what I'm saying, so that that era, that, that, that cruelty epoch, you had all of this killer merch out there. You had the band aesthetic and you had Stuart's guitar playing uh, in that lineup there. It's easy to see why for people like you and I, we just go, that's it. It's all there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's a great point. And there's another point I wanted to make that transitions from that is after that lineup split, this was like a seismic shift in metal for me because I remember reading the news and it was almost like out here with basketball, you got the Lakers and the Celtics baseball. You've got the Yankees, the Red Sox mm. at that time. It, for me, it was cradle and Dimu. And when I read the news that Nick had joined Dimu, I was like, oh, man, it was like it was crazy, crazy news. All the you know metalheads are talking about it, musician friends and whatnot. And when I heard what he did with them, it was almost like his playing got more furious and more angry and more violent as a response to what happened with Cradle. And I had always wanted to read something whether it was from the guys in dimu or the guys in cradle talking about one another and and how they felt about this i wanted there to be like a rivalry almost like public and whatnot and then maybe even a tour or something like that which i've always wanted to um ask danny if i had the chance but i mean what did you think about that when nick joined dimu yeah i i quite enjoyed dimu from the perspective that they had an australian guitarist in the band jamie or Aston now, mm, or Aston, right. I think his name was. So yeah. he was fairly well known here and then went over there. He was part of the Warhead Records label scene. Mm-hmm. I think he played guitar on that Lord Chaos uh, LP, which is quite good back at 95 and 96. Mm. And he'd gone over. It was very weird to hear someone from Australia going to Scandinavia unless their parents were from there. I, I don't, I think he's completely Aussie like what I am. So it was very strange to hear that he'd actually gone there. Usually, Plenty of people have gone to to, to America or to uh, the the United States or to England, Britain. Right. But I'd first time I'd ever heard of anybody. Not that I knew him, but I just heard about him through talking to the shop, the Hammer mm-hmm. House down in Parramatta. And they said, mm-hmm. "Yeah, he's gone over there." And was like, "Far out, it's too cold for a start." You know, what are we going to? do? Us Aussies don't really do well unless it's a ski resort where it's bloody. You know, you got thermal <laughs> heating and all the rest of it. But whatever. Anyway, yeah. he, he ended up in that band, and I quite liked Godless Savage Garden because I think he played guitar on that. And mm. what was the album, the full length that he appeared on from 1999? Sorry, I, I can't remember its name. Sorry, because oh, I'm a huge Demon fan. <laughs> Either way, the 1999 album, I thought that was, was pretty good. Name. I thought it was pretty good too, but I, I got to say, I'd never compared the two from the perspective that, and God help me here, I didn't think Demon were in the same league. Mm. I'm sorry. I know, I know yeah. a lot of people feel very, very differently about that. And I've since got become an appreciator. I've had a chat to Silent Oz, great fella, great mm-hmm. guitarist too, I might add. But I just never felt that that the Demu were in the same. They just didn't have the same quality of songs. And again, a lot of that does come down to to the contribution of Nick, you mentioned, and, and importantly, Stuart. Yeah, I think I I, I put them on a different level. I kind of Cradle was always separate for me. It was always like here's everybody in Norway. And then you've got cradle right here. Mm. And like you said, when cruelty came out, that would, that just like separated everything. Even myself, I didn't put that on the same level as Demu. I was a big Demu fan, fan, but like cruelty and the beast was up here and everything else was down here for me. Mm. They had a really high bar. Um, I was also a big fan at the time of uh, in flames. And yeah, likewise, yeah, huge fan of in flames. Love them. Yeah. And that's, to my point earlier about taking things too seriously and and being almost greedy with the old lineups and stuff. That's something myself. And I know a lot of in flames fans can't get over is the progression that they've made, but I think they're progressing in a more honest way. Um, Have you heard that? Sorry sorry to interrupt, but have you heard their new material? They've they've gone back. I just heard something new the other day and I was pleasantly surprised. It was really solid. 
And I don't fault any of these guys for this. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not going to hold any grudges against Danny Filth. I don't know the guy or anything like that. This is all just based on, you know, me as a, a teenage fan or in my 20s or whatever. That's still part of me, you know, kind of fangirling over this amazing band that I just fell in love with back in the day. And, you know, I would put corpse paint on, take dumb pictures of myself <laughs> to kind of look like them and um thinking back on how stupid that sounds now where i would be walking around the beach i'm i grew up near the water and i would walk around the beach on a sunny day wearing leather pants and a cradle of filth shirt you know all these necklaces and smoking a cigarette and thinking i'm really cool like yeah check this out and everybody else is probably like what the hell is this but that's the impact they had on me and to bring it back around to Stuart, one thing I did want to mention is that um, after that interview that I listened to, where you guys did recent, I listened to it recently. You did the interview, what, 2017, was it? Correct. Yeah. Yep. After I listened to that recently, I contacted you and I was trying to find Stuart because it was like, oh my God, somebody found this guy. He's the most elusive musician, you know, on, on the planet. Hmm. And I sent him a message on Twitter. I think it was you who said the best way to get him. That's was how on I Twitter. contacted him initially anyway. Yeah. yeah. And I just sent him a quick little message and I said, you know, this is great. You have no idea. You know, this is, you're so inspiring, blah, blah, blah. And he wrote back right away. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away because, you know, I've talked to a lot of musicians over the years and, you know, I'm not really, you know, I don't, freak out talking to somebody who's famous or whatever but this was different it felt different um because he's one of my idols and he was having a conversation with me just like you and i are right now we we're talking about music and the last thing he said to me was um you know i'd love to hear some of your work send me some links i want to hear it and i i want to listen to it send me some of your best stuff and I was like, all right. So I'm typing out all these long, you know, winded explanations of this song. And here's another song that, you know, you inspired, blah, blah, blah. And that was, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago. I don't really remember. That was the last thing I ever heard from him. He didn't respond or anything back. And it's still nice to know that I at least had that conversation with him. That will be my last memory, you know, of him, so to speak. Oh, I'm with you. And and your story as as mine is is repeated many many times. I've seen a lot of comments, and I've been, I've received a lot of messages too. Where blokes even used to call up his shop because I think he worked in a shop, and just said, "Hey, I just want to talk to you about Cradle," and he talked to them. <laughs> That's what's <laughs> he, great about him is he would listen to other bands. Like on your interview, hmm. he would talk about that how he loved to hear other musicians and hear what they've done to see you know the fruits of his labor. And how that paid off and what that created. Yeah, he's definitely the archetypal teacher from the perspective that he was curious. Okay, he was curious and he wanted to impart knowledge. There was the, the two mm. things that I think all great teachers have got. They're curious as to where somebody's at and what they want to learn. And he also had the inherent knowledge too, and he was willing to share that. He wasn't a hoarder of information. He actually wanted people to reach their potential. That's what I understand, of course. I didn't didn't have a relationship with him as a teacher or as a student to his teacher but that's what i understand based on many of the messages many of the comments that i've seen and it's just it's just a wonderful thing because it's so common man isn't it where people have got some level of expertise and they're like golem with the ring you know it's mine yeah. you know i want to try to monetize it or what have you that fucking monetize yeah. thing you know it's just it's just let's just be people okay mm -hmm. and let's just share ideas and let's just create a bit of a community evolve naturally yeah. Just, just do it. And he was the king of that because he never. My, my understanding is, I mean, gosh, I've, I've to to have some of his close friends reach out to me is what's happened. Um, you you just get a sense that this guy, this guy was an open book. Mm -hmm. He he's the sort of bloke you'd want to have a beer with. No, oh, you'd sure. want to you'd want to sit on a, a flight between Brisbane and Los Angeles yeah, with definitely. and have a killer co like I was very fortunate to be able to do and I'm so grateful that 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 the constellations aligned in that way and we're able to do that there's obviously it's tragic Stuart's passing is tragic from the perspective that his family no longer have a husband and father present so we're talking about it specifically from our fans from a fan's perspective but the issue overwhelmingly is that there's going to be a huge gap from 
there's there's not there's no it's not possible to have that cruelty lineup ever perform again, which is mm-hmm. where which is if, if I have a single issue with Danny, it's that. The idea that you can remint and recast cruelty with uh remastered drum tracks and the like. Okay. What have you? I, I've listened to it a couple of times. To me, it hasn't improved it, but then I'm very mm-hmm. used to what the original sounds like. But there was an opportunity there, and I expressed as much to Stuart to bring the that lineup together for a single show at somewhere like if the London Astoria is still there or Brixton Academy, one of these one of these great and famous British venues, and have the band on on display again, just doing their thing for one night. People like you and I would travel for that. Oh, That's, absolutely. That's the missed opportunity. Also, too, there's no liner notes and no contributions. And let's face it, from the bloke that that wrote most of that album, which mm-hmm. is just a it's a, it's a lost opportunity. But it just it's stupid. Why yeah. wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he reach out to them and ask them for their thoughts and for the blokes who actually to Stuart, Nick, and Les for the blokes that actually wrote the album? If yeah. you're re-releasing it in a way that it's going to potentially obtain a new audience, why not introduce these great musicians who who wrote the album to this new audience. Yeah. It makes me wonder as the, you know, newer generation of uh, cradle fans come in, are they going to be more apt to look into their past albums or are they going to be diving right into the newer stuff? It's um, going by the comments. There's definitely two camps. There's people like you and I, Mm-hmm. And I've long been on record as saying that my interest in the band stopped probably the day Midian was released. When I heard Midian, I just didn't like it and just stopped because I could tell that yeah. the the feeling and the soul of the band had, had shifted. No no slight whatsoever on Paula Linda. I want to be clear on that. But the sound that I wanted the band from the band was no longer present. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But there's people who got into all of the albums of a single one I could barely name uh, yeah. afterwards. And a lot of them have had a dig at me too about my perspective, but I make no apologies from from the point of view that my interest in the band is solely between 1994 or the early demos, if you like. Some of them are okay. They're pretty generic, some of them. But mm-hmm. from when Stuart joined the band, from, from 1994, so principle, I understand he wasn't on principle, but from that era, because some of those musicians, are, they're good guys and they're great musicians too. Like I'd love to have a chat yeah. with Paul Ryan. But of I course. think... I believe that there there is two camps and the more modern listener, so the younger person or the person that's got into them recently doesn't have the perspective that you and I do. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know, it's it's strange for me because I think about that question a lot, not only with Cradle, but with other bands, like I mentioned, In Flames. Um, The older I get, like the more I kind of understand both sides and my son is a testament to that because my son will listen to old McDonald, uh, you know, these kids songs on his, mm-hmm. his uh, iPad or whatever. And he'll, he'll dance to that. He loves it. But on the other hand, one of his favorite songs is Puritania by Demi Borgir. <laughs> he loves it. And he headbangs to it. He loves ghost. He loves Metallica, Meshuggah, all this heavy stuff, but he also likes, uh, music that my wife likes, Brazilian samba music, stuff like that, which I can't stand, but it's given me an appreciation for music as a whole because who am I to say, you know, you know, this is bad or whatever. If this moves you and this makes you move in a certain way and it it, it hits you here the same way that cruelty made us feel, I kind of let go of that elitist mentality that I, I used to have. I'll admit it, you know, back in the day growing up, I was an asshole about it. I was like, you know, you, you listen to cradle. Well, you, you've never heard dusk. Well, you're not a cradle of filth fan, but Mm. as I get older, I kind of let go of that and I'm okay with, you know, newer fans coming in. I wish that they would at least give that older era a try and, you know, try to dive into that. And maybe you'll gain some fans, you know, out of this right now who are, you know, intrigued by what we're saying or maybe they think we're a couple of pricks who don't know what we're talking about yeah yeah as i say i I see those comments and i've often i've engaged in conversation through youtube you know the comment section Mm -hmm. on youtube with people that have had digs at me about my my interest in the band but i make no apologies for the fact that yeah i'm only interested in the group from from effectively when Stuart joined to when he left yeah that's it 
and and yeah. yes, there's been a lot of lot of adjacent conversations. Like the comments, the, the I wish I could release a full chat with Paul that I had with Paul mm. that went for a couple of hours as well, because there's so much deep insight there, and I see people sort of postulating things, and I've actually got the answer to some of the questions that they're asking, but I I can't reveal that because Paul's asked me not to. You know, Paul so and I. Have, a... Sorry, you go. Sorry, go ahead. I was saying Paul. Um, Paul and I have had conversations off the record even beyond that. Okay, so, so he's not... a top fella. He's a good bloke. Oh, sure. I'm guessing that that was a conversation that for you answered a lot of questions and that would probably answer a lot for everybody out there um, in regards yeah. to the band and what went down. Yeah, it's the enigma. It's to be honest, mate. It's the enigma code. It's the breaking of the mm. enigma code. That one there. All of the postulations about the relationships in the band and yeah. the role of Danny and stuff. They're answered in that chat there. And you know why they're answered in that chat there? Because it's fucking Paul Alender. Yeah, he's Paul sure. Alender. He's the guy. Okay, he wrote mm -hmm. alongside of Paul Ryan. He wrote Principal. He came back mm -hmm. in. He wrote Midian, and he kept the band afloat. They're his songs. They are his songs. Mm -hmm from Midian right through to whatever the last album is uh, in 2011 or 12 when he left before he didn't want to go yeah. on a tour. And without him, I believe, if you can be summarised like this, without Stuart, the band doesn't break large. Without Paula Lender, Danny doesn't have a career. Correct. I agree. Okay. That's, now, yeah. Was that? His reasoning behind that, was that something that came after he would talked about it or was that something he prefaced before saying um, off the record, I want to tell you this, this and this, or was it afterwards he said, you know what, I'd rather, you know, let's not do that. Let's not go there. So there's two two ways I can answer that. The first way is that when I'm when I'm reaching out to people and ask from Cradle and, uh, and letting them know that I'm interested and we can have a chat, I say up front, mm -hmm. I'll give them complete and editorial oversight, nothing gets out there unless they go, mm, they give okay. me a thumbs up. That's that's just how it is. That's been Got the it. case for all of them except for the ones that – there's three interviews that I've conducted on the promotional trail. That's a bit of a different scenario. That's a different beast then. The Danny one was in uh, on the promotion for Cryptoriana, okay, because it's just expected that you're going to ask about the album and you can sort of yeah. log jam a few questions in and away you go on your 20 minutes that you're given, your half an hour that you're given. You know, the Australian mm -hmm. agent, the Australian, plus the Australian agent, I should say, trust me, John, trust me not to fuck around. That's okay. Because I've seen the interviews where people get Danny and they want to talk about such and Danny will actually say, hey, we're here to talk about the album. I'm not the guy, yeah. even though I'm intensely interested in, so say with George Fisher from Cannibal Corpse, I don't want to talk about Cannibal Corpse, even though I love Cannibal Corpse. I want to talk mm -hmm. about monstrosity. I was just thinking about that this morning, about his role yeah. in monstrosity, but I wouldn't do it if he had a Cannibal Corpse album to promote. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second thing is, so they get the editorial oversight. The, the, the second thing is I say say to all of the guys, and this obviously doesn't make the recording, talking about was, Stu, Nick, I say just talk. Okay, you have my word I'm not going to release anything or the facts that you don't want out there, I'm not going to talk about them. Of course, I allude to some things because I can, but I'm not actually mm -hmm. talking about things that they've asked me not to share. I said, sure. you can you can trust me because it's, and the proof is in the pudding. Those conversations have been out there for years and the things that they've asked me to remove, I have. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the Paul chat though was, he was, the word isn't nervous, but he was apprehensive at the beginning. He just, mm. he said it very politely. He just said, I, I don't want to talk about Cradle. I want to talk about what I'm doing with the unnamed horrors. So mm -hmm. my response was, let's just talk and you just, Whatever you want to say, just say. And if you want it out there after you said it, so be it. If you don't want it out there, it won't be out there. Okay, I'm not metal injection or fucking decibel or any of that shit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm not clickbait. It's mm -hmm. but yeah, my stuff. If you've probably seen, it gets picked up by blabbermouth all the time. But it's not me doing that. I'm not an agent of that. I just chat because I'm interested, sure. like you are. So I, I say to you, I said to him. We'll talk, and then if you feel uncomfortable at any stage, we can stop it. And the other thing, too, that I actually went even beyond that and said to Paul, if you don't even want this out there at all, there's no obligation. There's no. I'm a, I'm a husband and a father and a parent and a regular participative member of society, okay? I'm not interested in hurting people. Mm -hmm. It's not my not my bag. So if you don't want it out there, it's not going to be one of those things where I do some Patreon campaign, hey, pay me five bucks and you can listen to Paul <laughs> spill the fucking beans, you know, yeah. which people would do. I believe people oh, would course, do that. Yeah. Of course. So. He talked, and yeah, he answered a lot of questions that I had. Huge, huge volume of information was exchanged. Mm. 
But I don't know, even if that episode went out there fully intact as the conversation unfolded as the Stuart one did, would it would mm-hmm. it resolve a lot of things? I think Paul is smart enough to understand that the past is in the past. And you don't have to read between the lines to say that if he doesn't want to talk about something and he doesn't want to have it on record, okay, he doesn't feel that all that great about it. Which seemed, which on one level to people, I understand how for some people it seems absurd that Paul could be in the band and write ultimately what is now 60% of the band's music overall mm-hmm. has his name next to it or, or should have his name next to it if it doesn't. And yeah, that's another matter. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> this is the issue. Yeah. Um, that he doesn't want to talk about something that he's basically synonymous with. See, it's interesting. When you and I, I, I believe this is the case, correct me if I'm wrong, when you and I think about Cradle of Filth, we actually think about the musicians. I'm not actually thinking about Danny. Yeah, no, I agree. So when I think of all, all that era, and I have dived into some of it since my conversation with Paul, and the guitar riffs are spot on. And, and you know where I, you know, you know what helped me join the understand his his significant Paul's significant contribution to Cradle of Filth and how great a songwriter he was. It wasn't Cradle, it was White Empress. Mm. that's a good point yeah because you get to see him kind of like outside of that box and gives you better appreciation for what he can do Mm. um to your point though you doing that and respecting his privacy um that lends credence to you and your platform and it kind of like strengthens your foundation with this show you have and i mean man what a great job you've been doing with this and for you to be able to you know, hold true to your words and kind of like a code of honor like that. That's something that I think will, will get you very far in this business because there is just so much utter trash with clickbait and nonsense headlines and all that stuff out there that I think more people will start to be drawn to a platform like yours just because of how honest it is and how laid back and down to earth it is. Because in the end, People appreciate real conversation. And these days, especially, I think people are getting tired of the bullshit out there and tired of just, you know, it's either this side or that side or what team are you on, Hmm. you know, politically or whatever. This is like a real chat that you're having with somebody in your living room or, you know, at a bar or something like that. And that's a great thing. I want to see more of this in music. And I mean, Cheers to you and congrats to you for having this platform and being able to do this in such an honest way. It's really, really refreshing. Yeah, I really appreciate your feedback, mate. I really do. Uh, it means a lot mm. because I'm just being me. Okay, I can't. I can't write for. I've written for News Limited. I've written news media style articles. You know, I only went through uni a few years ago to be a journalist, so it came out. I was. I was this is all the while. Five the past five years that I've been doing the podcast, I've actually gone through uni to become a journalist. So it was really the podcast that inspired that too. Okay, so mm. it put some academic framework around it. And I learned whilst I was working, not that I saw a lot of it firsthand, but you only have to read the media to understand the dishonesties, how it's all about narrative. Yeah. It's yeah. not about getting out of the way and letting the real, like just the news be told. And it was, and, and truth be told, mate, it was always shit. You go yeah. back and you go back onto YouTube and you read that and, and you can watch headlines from, from, news bulletins that were released in the 80s and 70s and they're fucking garbage excuse my language but mm-hmm. they're just they're, they're all garbage they're all just whatever you know cnn's left wing fox's right wing and it's whatever fits in with that narrative we and that's been like yeah. that for a very long time and now it's affecting the free-to-air channels as it has been for about a decade or so here in australia probably the same in the states if you've still got free-to-air channels there you, where do you get your news source from what mm-hmm. is news these days you've sort of got to take it from a very broad and a very wide a wide range of sources, which is why I yeah. think long, long form conversations with a lot of nuance, with a lot of nuance, with a lot of people thinking at exactly the same time as they're talking. Mm-hmm. And that that isn't the quote, because that's what Blabbermouth's all about and all these other things. They pick up on when people say anything salacious. Okay. Yeah. But if you listen to the full five minutes of the conversation, not just the 15 second soundbite, okay, mm-hmm. you actually get context. And that's so crucial. You actually Absolutely. get things in context to what somebody's talking about because you're hearing the emotion that they're inflecting mm-hmm. there, there as well. And I think all of that is is so important. And hopefully, to your point, Pete, this what I'm doing, I can't understand why more people aren't doing it. 
because it's, it's not like it's hard, but then again, it might be where my talent set is. It might be all concentrated in this, meaning that this is what I'm put on this earth to do. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's sort of a seem to do lots of different things, but but it's. And I'm not even saying that I'm really good at it or anything like that. I'm simply saying it's what I do, okay? And people sure. don't seem to say no when I ask them whichever band it might be. Yeah. Um, you know, an adjacent point would be that <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to think about Cradle, but I've truly got to think about Morbid Angel. Mm. Morbid Angel had a... I've got to say, if more if Cradle had a Stuart and Cradle had a big impact, as did Trey and Morbid Angel. Mm, like Trey's yeah. guitar playing is just otherworldly. I've oh, listened. To, I've listened to his guitar playing isolated for. I've listened to it a lot, and I've even I'm even even gone to the extent of hitting up, and and it happened. I interviewed Trey's mum, had a conversation with his mother about oh, about wow. things, because Trey doesn't do interviews, as you probably know. Yeah, mm-hmm. and. You've just got to sit back and just let these people talk because hopefully one day Trey will want to talk and I hope it's with me. Sure. Because I just want to give him the mic and just say, I don't care if you want to talk about fishing. I don't care if it's hot rods because he loves all of this sort of stuff and you don't even want to talk (laughs) about the music. People want to hear from you, mate. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was saying is you're you're an honest guy and and people will be more attracted to that. I At least I hope. I don't know who in their right mind would want to go out and – do an interview with a platform that's only going to pick the little bits out because like you said, real conversation is nuanced. It has gray area. It's not black and white. Um, and I think that's how people truly are, you know, deep down, they, they have, you know, a belief here, they have a belief there and they're not so much, you know, on one team or the other. I think that media tends to, try and tell people what team they're on and say, you need to, if you're reading us, this is what you're going to read and this is what you're going to believe. And this is what you're going to think because we're going to control the narrative. Whereas in your sense, you're not, you're just sitting back saying, like you said, talk, let's talk. What do you want to talk about? Whatever Mm -hmm. it is. And that's a really honest way to go about this stuff. And it's really valuable for the history in a music sense, let's say the history of music, because years from now we're going to be gone some young kid somewhere is going to be sitting down and he's going to have this treasure trove of interviews that you have to dig through and just i can't imagine having what you've created now you know as a teenager let's say and just being able to dig through that and all these little tidbits of like you know info on how this was recorded how this was played how this was created whatever it's just a it's a goddamn gold mine <laughs> Yeah, thanks it again, really mate. Is. Yeah, yeah. And and that is reflected. One thing I've noticed is the people that I, I communicate with that have gotten, we you connect through the show, what have you, we're all very similar. You know, mm-hmm. that, that's what, no matter where we're from in the world, and it's mainly people from North America, Britain, hardly any Australians, which I find really interesting. My audience share in Australia is like 15% or something like that. Really? Yeah, I don't know what that is about. It's... um. I'm about as Australian as you get, but I just don't connect with fellow Australians for some reason. It's mm. I don't know whether it's the the medium, meaning heavy metal or what have you. Heavy metal isn't big here, mate. It's more trend driven. Mm. Hip hop is bigger here than heavy, way bigger than heavy metal here. Mm. I, I don't. I have no idea. Occasionally, I get hit up. There's some good people around. I'm not saying that there isn't good people around, but it's just the the volume of people that I talk to from North America and from Britain. It'd be ten to one. Mm compared to the Australian. So it's not even an organic thing in Australia here. It's being the internet, it's organic from the perspective that you can come from anywhere and plug in. I speak regularly to a bloke in Iceland. And oh, wow. a bit bloke a bit like you is in a killer band called Petronian. Oh, okay. And I just find I just find that we are we're like a, a global community of people that want the same thing, which is long form yeah. conversations, unvarnished. You want to hear it all. And that's why I, that's even why in the Stuart conversation I left him where he picked up a phone call. There's nothing salacious in the phone call. Yeah. You can hear him. That was answering. so cool to hear too. There was it just was real. It was a real moment. That's why I left it in. I mean, the if you took that to a university assessment, they'd go take it out. People don't want to hear oh, that. Yeah. I think, of course, yeah. For what, for what I'm trying to do here, which is give you everything, and if if people don't want to listen to parts of a conversation, or you know, occasionally we do talk politics, but more about our disgust of. Left the way the the left is sort of controlling narratives in big tech and and in the media and mm-hmm. the like. I'm quite happy to talk about that with anybody. Um, what's a guitarist name in? Oh, I'm going to kick myself now. The guitarist name in Suffocation. How can I not remember his name? The brilliant guitar player. Oh, that guy. Hold on. Let me uh, oh, pretend I mean, like I know it. Look it up. 
um, Terence yeah, Hobbs. Just, Terence Hobbs. How could I forget? Yeah. You know, this is you're having deep you're having deep conversations with people, and people just say things, and then you go with them. And if mm-hmm. you talk about politics, I've spoken about T- T- Terence and I tend to be more on the right side of politics, whereas somebody like like um, George Lynch definitely on the left. Oh, okay. But you can sure. still talk. Yeah, I had a, a made that conversation with George Lynch from Dokken that I had. That's an interesting one in that I wrote about it in the book, my the book that I released, but I had no uh-huh. idea his comments about Donald Trump would blow up like they did. Who, who <laughs> I would didn't think realize that? that happened. Fill me in a little bit. So talking about the music and I don't even know how we got into politics, but we started talking about politics and most of the the really outspoken people at the time when Donald Trump was in power were just talking about how much they hated him. This mm-hmm. is another example of it. But it was it was like it's not like he said anything that was unusual or newsworthy. Well, it was wrong, apparently. <laughs> Blabbermouth, metal injection, all of them. I think just it would be easier for me to mention the mastheads, the blogs that didn't pick it up. And it still gets quoted to this day. And that conversation took place in 2018. But when there's a chat with with George Lynch and he says anything political, it links back to the conversation I had with him where he talked about oh, wow. Donald Trump. And it's not my place to disagree with people, even if I think that they're wrong, like the singer from... Suicide Silence, again, whose name I've bloody forgotten who I spoke to, mm-hmm. you know, said some stuff about Black Lives Matter and all the rest of it, and he tried to draw a comparison between some of the issues we've got here in Australia with Aboriginal Australians and stuff, and he wasn't right, but it's not my job to tell him he's wrong. <laughs> I'm not going to yeah. pull him up on it. It's a, I, I say it's a safe space for whatever you want to say. You know sure. that? Common sense rules. Common sense rules, but I've never had anybody come on and say anything stupid from a yeah. from a, a racial or a pejorative. You know, nobody's ever used any racial pejoratives because people don't. Mm-hmm. People don't in these days. I mean, who the hell's going to come on and say something stupid? It just doesn't. It just doesn't happen. So, by and large, there is one. That's the thing. Sorry, I'll just round out this. Round out the point by saying this: there's no censorship, and I think that's yeah. the issue that we've got these days is that there is so much censorship going on. When people listen to the show, they know it's unvarnished, but they know mm-hmm. that that means it's not censored. So whatever somebody says, it's going to be completely in context, and even if it's a thought bubble, it's left intact. Absolutely, and it's it's not an easy job. I tried years and years ago. I was buddies with the people who ran. Um, Metalunderground.com, I think it was hmm. one of these metal news sites back then. And it was after I mentioned earlier, Peter Steele passed away. Big, big impact on me. And after he passed, I wanted to do like some type of tribute. Uh, so I contacted the guys at Metal Underground. I said, what if we do like a tribute record and get together all these bands and, you know, we all do a cover songs of uh, typo songs and carnivore and nice. pay homage nice. to Peter Steele. And they were like, that's a great idea. Let's do it. Um, and I, at some point in that conversation, I had to contact Johnny Kelly, the drummer from typo and kind of get his blessing and talk to him about it and also interview him for metal underground. And I was like, interview him. I haven't really interviewed anybody before. Okay. And I was experimenting with like podcast stuff at the time. Didn't really know what I was doing. And they told me, okay, here's Johnny's number. You call him, you talk to him, blah, blah, blah. I'd never done this before. Mm, and it was basically like, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. It was like asking me to do what you do so well, but you know, I'm a dumbass with that stuff. I, had no clue what to do so i called him up and i'm again i'm a huge typo negative fan so like he picks up the phone he's like yeah and i'm like is this uh is this johnny kelly he's like yeah i'm like uh-uh. hey how's it going uh how's your day going man he's like all right and i was kind of nervous I, I was starting to sweat a little bit and I'm, you know squirming in my chair but then we just started talking and next thing you know, we went on for like almost two hours just talking about drums, snare drums, recording, mm. um, how my friend's mom almost ran over him at a concert oh, <laughs> that they were wow. playing and he was crossing the street and my friend's mom almost ran over him while he was carrying a bass drum and having a good laugh about that. And, you know, we finished the conversation and, you know, left it on good terms, whatever. and then. I talked to the guys at Metal Underground the next day and they said, 
Oh, great. How'd the interview go? Uh, I was like, oh, it was fantastic. We talked for two hours. They're like, all right, great. Uh, when can you have that to us? I'm like, well, it's right here. What do you want? An MP3, a wave file? They're like, no, I mean the transcription. I'm like, yeah. excuse me? <laughs> They're like, you have to transcribe that interview and uh, the whole thing. I'm like, what do you mean? Like type out everything we said? They're like, yeah. I'm like, oh, shit. I didn't realize I had to do that. So then I'm going back and, you know, typing this whole long thing. I, I didn't even know if it got published to the site. Um, so that gave me a newfound respect for what you do and other people do in this business. It's it's very daunting, very difficult. Yeah, I think it's it's a case of the sort of... So I'll make this point first. The the first five to ten interviews that I did couldn't have been with bigger names at the time. Like my first ever conversation, a bit like your Johnny Kelly, mine was with the drummer, Vinnie Apiso. And oh I, wow. Jeez, I love what Dehumanizer. Yeah. I mean Dehumanizer was an album I listened to front to back. Oh, sure. Yeah. So it was a, it was easy on one level, but at another level you're talking to Vinnie Apice, you know, John Lennon's drummer. Just keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're talking to this guy who's been in the presence of guys like John Lennon and and I didn't have an issue. I used to be an account executive and, and so I was used to standing in front of people who were self-important and, and and having to sort of plead my case when you're selling things and all the rest of it. But mm. This felt very different. <laughs> and it was, you know what it was? It was in that conversation, I could hear that he, I could hear the beeping of his car alarm and the roller door opening up. To him, this was just another chat and a long day of interviews. Sure. And I've got, to, I've got to say that made me feel pretty good because it didn't make me feel like I was on the spot so much. Mm. The the and, I, and I've learned... I've conducted almost 700 interviews at this point, and most of them have been posted as uh, podcast episodes. But I've wow. long learned that the experienced people, the guys like Vinny and Carl from Bolt Thrower, even the guys in Cradle, they're the best ones to talk to because there's some life experience. They've been around the world. They, they, they know mm -hmm. that, we, you know, whether you're a kid in the, if they've got suburbs in Japan, if you're a young kid in Japan listening to heavy metal, you're not really all that different to you or I. Or yeah, even South America, point. for that matter, because they've met everybody, and I've certainly travelled enough. And my wife's family are from the Philippines, and I've spoken to a few metal heads over there. They're no different to us, mate. Believe me, we eat different food. Oh, well, they don't from me because my wife cooks a lot of Filipino food. But mm. we, um, we're not really all of that different. It's just geographical circumstances and the the lottery of where we're born sort of change things. Yeah, but. It's the younger musicians that I get, particularly the local ones here in Australia that I get, and I open, I ask an open-ended question and they find a way to answer it with a yes or a no. And I don't even release really? those conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you go from Stuart, the four-hour-long conversation with Stuart yeah. where we're just diving into <laughs> It's easy to, again, to mention the things that we're not diving into to sure. a local musician who's on the promotional trail and you're trying to get a conversation started. And I've long since, I've long since stopped doing those interviews. Yeah, I just won't do them. Uh, it makes it too hard. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's, yeah. No, I was going to say in regards to that tribute album I was talking about, mm. Cradle was one of the bands we contacted, and we got yeses across the board from um, Cradle of Filth's camp. Dave Ellison from Megadeth wanted to do it. A um, bunch of big name musicians, and then it was like, all right, what's our budget? what budget what do you mean <laughs> like well we got to put these guys up in a hotel what studio are we going to book them um you know we got to get licensing rights this and that and i was like oh all right and i my idea went from this to just go Pew! and just shrank down to this little blip and i'm like well this is not possible um but the cradle camp was really enthusiastic i remember they wanted to do a typo song I don't remember which one they wanted to do, but that was always something I wished I could have heard was them do a typo negative cover. That would be an interesting. Oh yeah. My girlfriend's girlfriend would have been perfect for them. The oh, keyboards sure. and stuff. Yeah. I love yeah. typo as well. I wish I'd seen mm. them. I don't think they ever toured Australia though. Really? No, nah, but I, I remember getting, I got into them a bit late in inverted commas on October Russ. So there were a few albums mm. in by then. And I know that wasn't their high watermark. You have to sort of go back to Bloody Kisses and, or you're, you'd be the expert. I, I sort of listen to yeah. them occasionally. But, but oh gosh, I love Pete Steele's voice and the juxtaposition between those deep bass grooves. Of, he was, he was a heavy metal Paul McCartney in so many ways. Oh, know? yeah. And he loved the Beatles too. I mean, he, that was a huge influence on them. Mm. Um, I'll never forget the day I, I met them at a convention. It was like a rock and horror movie convention. And we were walking around looking at little, you know, trinkets here and there. And 
Typo was playing a concert that night after the convention across the street. Hmm. So we're walking around and they were like announcing over the loudspeaker, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, we have a surprise typo negative. We'll be doing a uh, signing here at the convention in a half hour from now. And I'm like, what typo negative is going to be here. Oh my God. So I started drinking bottles of wine. I was, you know, getting nervous. Like, what am I going to say? This is hmm. you know, long before that uh, conversation with Johnny. So I was even more, you know, freaked out. I was going to meet my favorite band. And I was like, I don't know, 10 mini bottles of uh, Merlot deep oh, wow. into this, this, um, this line that we were all waiting in. And um, we got up there and Pete Steele stood up and he, he went and shook my hand. His hand was like, you know, yeah, a giant, yeah. you know, mattress compared to my skinny little skeleton figures, fingers. And he was like, yeah, how's it going? First thing he said was, uh, yeah, this is your girlfriend. I'm like, yeah. He's like, yeah, I'm going to take her home with me. Huh? You know, joking <laughs> around like that. And I was like, you, okay, sure. Go ahead. And, you know, I was just this little music nerd who was in awe of his favorite band at the time. That and sounds like Pete Steele, doesn't it? Sounds like something you'd oh, do God, though, even yeah. before if some if someone else said it, you'd go, "That's a bit gross, isn't it?" But with yeah, Pete no. Steele, you just go, "That's just on brand." Totally, yeah. That was his character, and they played after that, and that was a show I'll never forget. Um, it was just mind blowing how they were able to perform that stuff and have that atmosphere on stage. And going back to the Cradle thing, I was going to ask you, did you ever see Cradle live? I think you mentioned that you did. I saw Stuart. Danny. Yeah, I you actually saw Stuart. Stuart, believe it or not. Yeah, I'm okay. one of the few that can when I say few, I know there's it's it was 1997 and mm-hmm. I was living in Sydney at the time and they played this thing called Roadblock Festival, which was a I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna heap shit on the guy that organized it, but you wouldn't do it the same way again. And we mm-hmm. talked about that at length on the show. But uh the cradle went on stage at some ridiculous hour, like one o'clock or something. It was it was too late, and we, mm. we'd suffered through you know all of the clone bands. You know, this band sounds like Malevolent Creation. This band sounds like Morbid <laughs> Angel. Yeah, oh, good. It was it was a lot like it that night. Yeah, the, the Australian metal scene wasn't at its high water mark in 1997. I can assure you. Mm. And and I don't know why these. It should have just been a support band cradle. And they actually played songs of cruelty that night. And I, I can't tell you which songs they were because I couldn't, I didn't know the songs, but Danny actually said, and they were they were fucking amazing, even though it was late. And we all sort of, to be honest with you, wanted to go home by the end of it. It was just an amazing gig. I wasn't drinking at the time. I was I was only 19 or 18 at the time. 19, 1997, I think it was. Yes, 19, 19. And so I wasn't, I hadn't started drinking even at all by that stage. And so I was driving me and my mates everywhere. And it was mm-hmm. an amazing, it was a truly amazing gig. I didn't notice Stuart so much that night. The person I noticed mostly was was Nick. Just was just in awe of Nick. Nick really? was oh, it was yeah. That it was again that lineup, but that lineup had Les. Uh, Greg had mm. long since gone, and Les was playing. But you had John oh, okay. or Gian, yeah, and, and and the rest of the crew. And I, Sarah was in the group from memory. It's a hazy memory, but I'm pretty sure she was up there on stage, and I think she's confirmed that with some photos she's put on social media only this last week talking about the Australian mm. tour in 90, I think she said 98, but she means 97 because that's when they came down. And I, yeah. to, to your point about my chat with Danny, I had to remind Danny he actually did that show because he said, no, I didn't. Yeah. Said, yes, he did. Yeah. The he thought up. it was like 99 or something, right? Well, like, they came back in 2001, but they sucked. Oh, okay. There wasn't. It, they'd lost what was it. the joke that he told that you said there was – I was dying laughing when I heard you say that. It was something oh, he said on stage. Uh, about Michael Hutchins. Uh, Michael Hutchins had just died. <laughs> yeah. The irony is Michael Hutchins had just died in, in a hotel room, which wouldn't have been five kilometres away from where that gig was. Yeah. And Michael mm-hmm. Hutchins, as you remember, was enormous through the 80s and 90s, and it was oh, a God, huge yeah. star in Australia. Just mm-hmm. in, in excess and in excess with just the band until o- Oasis or whatever it was sort of killed their momentum, I think it was, wasn't it? But yeah. he said... He said it was all big in the media. People were talking about it. And he said, I just heard Mike, you know, I won't do the voice, but this song is dedicated to Michael Hutchins. We just heard news. We just got the news. And then he very quick, he, he waited a bit. And I'm thinking, fuck, are they going to perform, you know, <laughs> an in excess song or, you know, yeah. something adjacent? And then he says, I'm glad that fucking cunt's dead. 
<laughs> and I'm sorry, God help us, but all we all pissed oh, ourselves crazy. laughing in the audience. And yeah. he had us. He had us then. Yeah, it was a long night. But when he said that, he he said a few other things. There was an, the other gig that I went to. He, uh, what happened was somebody was throwing around for whatever reason an Ingvay Malmsteen T-shirt, and it was getting ripped to shreds. Oh, and yep. eventually, eventually got thrown up onto the stage. And then he picked it up and he looked at it. Then he looked back at us. It was just the way he did it. He looked at it. He goes. You know, and that voice, how dare you defile my guitar hero or something. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ingway's a wanker. We know that. Jeez, I mean, oh, how many sure. his stories are litany out there? I, I don't even think I'd yeah. talk to, I'd interview Ingway, even though I love the first three albums. I love the first yeah. three albums to death, but nothing else. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he, but Stuart mentioned something interesting. He said that that all of Danny's lines were re- pre-rehearsed. Nothing was in the really? moment. That's Which interesting. I, I thought it was really interesting because to me, Danny made it look like it was very much in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. In, on both occasions there. And, and look, the second one was probably in the moment. But yeah. the the first one about Michael Hutchins, he'd probably been practicing all day. And it was a bit like when mm. Princess Diana died. You know, we're a member of the bloody Commonwealth still. So back then when Princess Diana died, it was everywhere. Same thing with Michael Hutchins because the two events happened at about the same time. Oh, sure. So we had these two, two enormous people on the public psyche pass away and Danny just happened to mention, I mean, as if you'd mentioned Princess Diana, the media would rip you to shreds. You know, yeah. satanic metal band defiled <laughs> band princess. <laughs> it might be the publicity that they were going for, but... Uh, yeah, exactly. I was going to say that. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. I remember seeing Stuart not in person, but what was the... It was the live... Uh, concert that came with the at the time VHS. It's going to date me back, but for the from the Cradle to Enslave was it? Yeah, I had or to it the VHS copy as well. Yeah, <laughs> and they had the little bits in between where they were in the chair, and uh, John was like, "This is fucking John," and blah blah blah. He's doing a Sean Connery accent. That's where mm-hmm. I I realized he pronounced his name differently than I was pronouncing it wrong all mm-hmm. those years. Called him like Gian or Gian or I don't know, and. um they played that concert and kept cutting a clips of Stuart playing and he had blood coming out of his mouth. And I was like, this is the coolest looking guy ever, man. I want to be like that on stage. And the problem was, is that all the bands I was in didn't want to look like that, hmm. but I did. So I would, I would come on stage with my BC rich and my blood coming out <laughs> and my hair and stuff. And everybody else is like, you know, dressed like a beach boy or something and <laughs> i stick out like a sore thumb which is why i now play by myself and not in the band so. that's a smart move i've got to say yeah playing in bands yeah. i i could relate so much of what stuart talked about not that i had anywhere near the same things happen on the scale that he had but i could mm-hmm. relate because gosh how many dickheads have you played in bands with just just un- people who were just oh, either God. rude or they don't learn material the big thing is not learning material and turning up and that was his thing not contributing mm-hmm. to the songwriting. Stuart's thing was yeah. with John. And, and as you know, you, you listen, you heard, Nick Nick threatened John with physical violence unless he started writing some music. Yeah. Because they, they wanted contributions. Stuart always wanted the full band. And, look, mm-hmm. I, I tried that myself back in the late 90s with people and you bring people in and, yeah, I, even though I'm writing all of the music, you know, if we you, you talk, you talk the shit. You go, yeah, if we ever make it big, you know, you can have, you know, we'll split it four ways and we'll be a real band and it's all mm-hmm. bullshit because they oh, don't yeah. care. These people could care less. They're just – I've even had – I play covers, as you probably know from listening to the show – yeah. Covers gigs, which pay the individual between two and three hundred dollars. It's not huge money per night, mm-hmm. but imagine you got your day job, and if you don't have many other commitments, and you're playing twice a week, and you're getting an extra six hundred bucks a week. You know, sure. it, over long term, it is life changing money, and that that can be the money that goes in your rent or your mortgage or what have you. You don't mm-hmm. have to worry. But the condition is, you got to learn the material. Mm-hmm. You got to learn the song. So whether you're playing Kryptonite by Three Doors Down, which is the stuff I play, or something by Cold Chisel or In Excess or any of this stuff, just learn the song. You, you turn yeah. up and you because you generally speaking, you don't rehearse. It's just the song's there. So you're a, pro, you're a professional musician, turn up and play. They haven't learned the song. And so you're on stage and you're looking over going, they're like, what's the next chord? And you're going, I'm not helping oh, you. That's the worst. Oh, how many times has it happened yeah. though to you? It's probably happened a lot. Yeah, and that's one thing that always ticked me off about working in bands. A lot of times I worked with guys that, 
they're big talkers, you know, they would talk, they would have the whole outline of the band for the next 20 years, like in their heads. And they would tell you about it all the time. Like, we're going to do this. We're going to have this type of tour. We're going to be bigger than this band. We're going to, our merchandise is going to look like this. And our, our tour, our stage is going to look like this. Our bus is going to be like this. And I'm sitting here like, can we write some bloody music? I mean, for fuck's sakes, I want to write some music. Let's, mm. let's get to the riffs. Oh yeah, we'll get to that. But you know, let's talk about this first. And that always ticked me off. I had a lot of good friends growing up that were really fantastic musicians that were like cream of the crop. And sadly I lost a lot of their friendships due to drugs, alcohol, and just, they kind of went their way. I went my way. And then the guys who always wanted to do like the fame and fortune thing, they're now, you know, have nothing to do with music. And they kind of just forget that whole thing and, and moved on to something else. But I've always been about, you know, writing, recording, playing, trying to get into like, you know, the meat of the song, so to speak. That's that's my wheelhouse. Yeah, I can relate. I can relate. That's why I gave up with originals bands. It was mm. just too hard eventually. For the f- very few venues that are around town, you can play. And we played in all of them, but, you know, playing on Wednesday yeah. night or what have you. So yeah. not, uh, the typical scenario, playing in front of wives and girlfriends and extended family members and mates or what have you, just got – you just do it for 10, 15, even – I think I did it for about 15 years at that point. When no, I'm not doing it anymore. It's silly. Mm. So at least if I'm playing covers, I'm getting paid. And I know it's not about just getting paid, but – at my, this point in my life, yeah, it has to be some sort of a trade-off if I'm going to be taken away from the family for an extended period. Of course. Your time is valuable. So it's made it's as I said up top, there's always something going on. And mm-hmm. and the band that I'm playing in at the moment, they spring a lot of songs on me at the last moment. I just write them out though, and I have a little sheet in front of me and I just make sure that I know I can read my own writing effectively from on stage. Yeah. Well, that's and that's good. that's just the deal. Yeah, that's just the yeah. deal. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not perfect, but it's at least at least I'm still playing. The important thing for me is to keep on playing, whatever it might mm. be. So whether I'm playing Michael Jackson songs, never play metal because you just don't play metal in in these uh, in these sorts of venues. The closest thing you probably get to it, as I say, is the Three Doors Down or Foo Fighters sure. stuff. Yeah, that's as heavy. I had as somebody ask me about that recently. It was a. Uh, younger musician who was starting out in a cover band and he had said um we're playing all these local gigs but nobody's dancing nobody's standing up people are like leaving and stuff and we have the most phenomenal guitar player in the world and and you know nobody's like appreciating his talent and i said well you know what kind of stuff are you playing and they said well i can't remember the song but they stopped in the middle of the song so the guitar player could do a 10 minute solo to show oh how much of a virtuoso. Oh and I said, God. you're in a cover band. The people that want to, that, that want to move, they want to move to this stuff. They want to get up. They want to dance. They want to hear something familiar, something that, you know, strikes a chord with them here. They don't want to hear, you know, some big Joe Satriani solo. And he was like, what do you mean? I mean, he's so talented though. And I said, yeah, but let, you know, Talent is kind of subjective in that sense, where if you're playing in a cover band, a great cover band is going to, like you said, they're going to know the song, they're going to play it, they're going to do a solid job of playing what they're supposed to play, as opposed to the guys who want to show off, you know, and and make it different and stuff like that and do different variations of it and whatnot. It kind of loses the crowd a little bit. Um, I was going to make a point. Was it... What interview was it where somebody had to answer the door? Was that the Stuart one? Or was the he Stuart, trying to answer? Stuart answered the phone. I couldn't say, I can't remember who it was. It rings, uh, yeah, it, pun intended, rings a bell. But <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I can't remember which one that was. It was, there's there's been some really interesting things happen during during calls here, yeah, during conversations and stuff. People have been ordering fast food. I just edited it out. <laughs> so, you know, Eric, Eric Peterson from uh, Testament was ordering coffee. I remember that. Yeah, oh, he, nice. had the, he had the shits when I called him, actually, because he thought that I'd fucked up the times. I hadn't. I <laughs> called him at the time I was allocated, but he been waiting half an hour. What are you doing? And Eric's a, he's a good bloke, isn't it? No. Yeah. I'm not throwing shade at Eric whatsoever. But uh yeah. that was the one that that was a good that was a conversation that I think if it had happened earlier, or if you were a less experienced interview or someone who does this, you would probably be thrown off off right away. Mm. And uh I've said this uh, a lot. I've so I told this story a few times on the show, but the conversation with Rex did happen. Rex from Pantera, mm-hmm. um, 
if that had happened now, what happened at the beginning of that, I'd say, Rex, if it's not a good time to chat, maybe we just shouldn't do this. Okay, I missed out on that too. What happened with that? So he, so you you get this number and might be his mobile number. This is back when before really the Skype and the the Zoom thing kicked in. So okay. 2017 again, and called him and he pretended not knowing what the call was about. And I thought I'd got the wrong number. He goes, <laughs> no, I'm just fucking with you. And I thought, oh, there's his Texas sense of humor. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a bit, a bit like a bit like some of the outback rural Queenslanders here on Northern Territory people. They've got a twisted sense of humor, right? So I thought, yeah, mm. okay, I can relate, whatever. But <laughs> then I went, oh, it's great to talk to you. Been a fan of Pantera and more specifically your bass playing. And then he went, hold it right there. I don't, I'm sorry to do the accent, but, you know, he said, if this is going to be a heavy metal interview, I don't want to do it. But the way you said it, and I was like, okay, That's true. I guess we'll talk about your new album, which isn't that great. I'll try to sort of put a good spin on it. Because he released a solo album in 2017. <laughs> it went, it didn't really go anywhere. Well, was yeah. it just country music? Or? It was It was what you'd expect from him, I suppose. It was more like countrified rock, but more on the mm. rock side. It definitely mm. had his, it was just weird. He, he's not a guitarist, and you can hear that. Yeah, you can hear that it's very. It's how I. It's and I can relate because it's how I play guitar. It's just bar chordy. Yeah. There's not. There's not the embellishments that I think great guitarists put into things. You know, like what Stuart does. There's just not those. Mm. Those you can play a little arpeggio or or just something that joins two chords together that isn't just a straight snap snap. Yeah, and, yeah. and so I, I talked it up because that's my job. I felt at the time was to talk it up, and it's Rex. You want to support what he does, but I wouldn't. I'm not saying I wouldn't tolerate it or put up with it, but I thought he was quite rude to be honest with you. And I don't, don't mm. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I got to go back and listen to it. I edited it out. I should say the front oh, the you beginning. Did? Yeah, oh. yeah. I should have left it in there really, so as it was on display. And I got off easy. I listened to oh. some of the other interviews that he did, like with the Metal Injection guys. And he didn't even answer their questions. He just point blank refused oh, wow. to answer the question. Damn. And he was not in a good place. But then hmm. I'm okay to say this because he's been he's he's I've read his book and he talked about it, but he's he's a really bad alcoholic. Hmm. And uh I can't imagine how bad that must be. So I've got some sympathy for him yeah. on that front too. Think Definitely. about alcoholism if you've been around alcoholics, you know. I'm a, one of our good mates in Sydney, I'm confident as an alcoholic, not confident, but I'm sure he is just based on mm-hmm. how he reacts around alcohol. It's like like one drink is never enough, but it's like one drink yeah. is too much at 99 drinks is never enough, that old saying, and you can really see yeah. that with some people. And I've got to admit, sometimes I'm a bit like that too due to my bloody Irish heritage, mm-hmm. you know, like nothing happens. I mean, some of the interviews I've done have been half cut, mm-hmm. you know, early on, but that's just because it's been late at night and because I've been tired and you just need something to kick you along and before you know of you've course. had four vodkas. You yeah, I always ran into that where it's like <laughs> – there's some people like, I, you know, I love, I'm a big wine snob. I love wine. I kind of like move from thing to thing. I used to be all about mm. beer, then I whiskeys. Now I'm on this big wine kick, but it's controlled, you know, on the weekends, maybe here and there with dinner. Yeah. Sometimes I let loose. And over the years, my friends and I, we've loved to get together, get drunk, get wasted and have a good laugh. Next day, wake up, go to work, you know, all is well. But like I was mentioning before, some of those friends, they couldn't let go the next day and go to work and operate. They had to keep drinking and drinking and drinking. Um, I had a buddy who he needed to finish a bottle this big of vodka just to be able to go to work in the morning. Oh, really? And he, yeah, he would have to like, and that's not to get drunk. That's just to be able to function like you and I are right now Mm. to where you get to that point where it's like, you know, you're taking a break and going to the bathroom and swigging vodka just to feel normal again. I've had friends that were, you know, hooked on pills and other drugs and stuff where it just eats you alive. And it's, it's, I'm thankful, count my blessings that that demon hasn't, you know, dug into my soul, so to speak, because I've seen it destroy some people from top to bottom. And it's really, really a tough thing to deal with. Yeah, I've, I've said to my kids, they're not drinking. They're, they're only young, as you know. I've said to them, <laughs> yeah. I, I just said to them straight up, you're not even starting, so don't even think about it. Yeah. And I've never done drugs. Scary but, thing. Yeah, straight up, I've just said it's it's alcoholism is actually in the family. My auntie was an alcoholic. Mm. Uh, you, she was a bad one. And mm. 
you, you don't want to go down that pathway. You don't want to find out if you've got that gene. It's a bit like smoking. Some people can smoke all their lives and they just die of old age or something else. But other mm-hmm. people, they smoke, you know, for a couple of years in their teens and they get lung cancer by the time they're 34 or 35. It just yeah. depends on whether or not you've got that gene. But you don't know until you've gone well down that path. Mm-hmm. And I, I, so I just said to them, they've got, they got enough things going on and good things that are, you know, great things that should be in their, their horizon anyway, not to worry about buddy getting pissed like what. It was just a dumb thing. Certainly as a young Australian, it was just what we did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You go out, you get pissed. You, you come home from work, you drink beer. Yeah. And I know I fell into that category and and – and nothing happened. It's not like I went out and smashed a car up and beat my wife. Nothing happened. It's just I affected I, – if I'd kept on going, I would have affected my health. There's no doubt about it. And I yeah. think I've just got to really measure, pace it out these days, just being 44. Any, sure. of the, any of the damage I do now won't be felt until I'm about 50, you know, late, late sort of 50s or what have you. And then mm-hmm. – uh, and I should say my uncle I think was an alcoholic too. I think he was a functioning one though. Like he wouldn't know, you know, one yeah. of those blokes who just sort of drank every day. As opposed oh, to needed sure. it to sort of, you know, needed it to sort of function. He just sort of drank and and I this is the thing that comes up with musicians a lot too. It comes up oh, all sure. the time. Uh Jasper from from In Flames, mate. Have you been yeah. following what's going on with him, that poor bastard? Yeah. It's sad, He's mate. Been struggling for a while too, as far as I know. Um I was trying to think how to bring that back to cradle again. And Stuart and that whole conversation when I was young when I first started writing songs um I started out on a four track recorder mm. so doing everything by hand you know I'd play the drums on a keyboard and layer over the bass guitars whatever of course trying to copy what Cradle was doing with Cruelty and you know writing songs that I were calling my own but they were just bad rip offs of Cruelty <laughs> and I remember when I first started writing lyrics I was trying to write like Danny was, but I smoked a lot of pot. And at the time I had no fucking clue what he was talking about. I didn't know about old English, you know, poetry and all this stuff. I kind of just picked up words and stuff and I was all over the map. I was writing songs about, you know, ex-girlfriends trying to use that type of language. And then I'd start writing about like Lord of the Rings shit because I'd be listening to Zeppelin on another day and Mm. they would write a lot of songs about Lord of the Rings stuff. And my nerd brain with all that pot and stuff was just mixed together. And it was just a a disgusting mess of a song. And then the older I got, the more I started like writing honest lyrics and stuff like that. And the more I let go of that, uh, you know, pot smoking and all that stuff, that's something that long gone i started noticing i would open up more lyrically to where now i'm writing songs that aren't ripoffs of cruelty and the beast but they're heavily influenced in subtle ways you know like we talked about stewart's playing going up and Mm -hmm. down the neck like that those little things are trickling into my songwriting here and there and um this latest thing i'm working on i have a song that I wrote about my mom who passed away a couple years ago and it's a metal song, but it doesn't start like a metal song. It starts out with, you know, pianos and orchestra Mm. or whatever kind of corny, but um, I wanted to capture sonically what it sounded like watching my mom get cancer, struggling through it and then passing away from it. Yeah. And so I did that, but those Stuart riffs started coming out because it started getting like, really evil and really like gross sounding because I was trying to like capture what cancer sounded like in my head and his songwriting and his playing inspired me in that sense where I started noodling around going up and down the fretboard and doing these accompanying harmonies and stuff and I remember playing it for my dad who my dad doesn't listen to heavy metal maybe ACDC uh and he's you know never listened to Cradle of Filth or anything like that Mm. but he started tearing up at it And I'm like, you know, what's going on? He's like, that's just so beautiful how you're able to put these things together like that and layer it. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a testament to what Stuart has done because without him, yeah, I'd I'd be writing a song, you know, maybe differently here and there, but he helped me figure out how to get that stuff out and get it from here to here to one of those guitars and, you know, into the computer. I don't think I better wrap things up. So I don't think I could end on a better note than that. That's awesome, mate. Thanks for sharing that. 
That's really yeah. poignant, you know, that you were able to draw draw one inspiration, connect connect the two inspirations together, if I can frame it that way, and turn yeah. it into music, if you like. And yeah, I too have lost, you know, I lost my father too. So I get what you're saying, but it's it's a very weird thing to lose a parent. Um, Absolutely. Especially when you feel like you've got a lot of your own life left. You sort of feel like you're half an orphan or something. Yeah. Um, when it when it occurs. But yeah, that's a really nice way to end it, mate. Thanks very much for tuning in to Daniel Mitchell and I talking about, amongst other things, the tremendous legacy that Stuart Anster's former Cradle of Filth guitarist, the tremendous legacy that he leaves behind. So that's all for now. I appreciate that you've tuned in to this tribute to Stuart. If you want to listen to more episodes featuring conversations from the world of hard rock, heavy metal, extreme metal and beyond, go across to scarsandguitars.com and scroll through the scroll through the list of chats that are already posted and something else. I have written a book, Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, Conversations from the World of Hard Rock, Heavy Metal and Beyond. Click on the link in the banner and you'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice. And you can download a sample if you do complete the purchase. Hit me up because I want to thank you in person. Again, my name's Andrew Mackay-Smith. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. I appreciate it. And until next time, it is a very goodbye for now.